Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. It's story time, folks, and have we got some history for you today. I'm Steve Gelly, along with Rod Mullins, and on today's episode, it's the story of a mostly Cherokee Confederate military regiment known as Thomas's Legion, headed by a North Carolina legislator and Cherokee chief named William Holland Thomas. This sounds interesting, Steve. When I first heard about this, I thought you were talking about Thomas's Foreign Legion, but you... you pointed out to me correctly that this is Thomas's Legion, and this has to do with something that I'm sure a lot of people have not heard a lot about, and that is a Cherokee Confederate military regiment. We don't hear a lot about this. No, we don't, but we did touch just a little bit on Thomas's Legion in our podcast about Champ Ferguson. Yes, and we did. his attack at Saltville. William Thomas was born in 1805 in Waynesville in Haywood County, North Carolina. As a teen, he was apprenticed to a store owner who just so happened to live near the Cherokee Nation. And just like another teen named Sam Houston who lived on the other side of the Smokies over in Tennessee, young William became a member of the Cherokee, learning the language and customs of the tribe to the point where Chief Yonaguska adopted him into the tribe and gave him the name Will Usti, or Little Will. Well, Thomas also learned the law, becoming an attorney, as well as establishing a very prosperous business empire in the area around Waynesville. After Yanaguska's death, William became, believe it or not, Rod, chief, and guided Mm. the local Cherokee who managed to remain in western North Carolina through the tough times that came after the Trail of Tears. Using his legal skills and status as a chief, the incidentally only white chief ever in the Cherokee tribe, Thomas managed to regain control of some of the tribal land, as well as ensuring a degree of autonomy for the tribe in the Appalachian Mountains. In 1848, William Thomas was elected to the North Carolina legislature as a Democrat and remained there until North Carolina's secession in 1861. At the outbreak of war, Thomas returned to western North Carolina and formed the Junaluska Zoav, consisting of 200 Cherokee warriors to aid the Confederacy. By April of the next year, Thomas's force was integrated into the main Confederate Army as the North Carolina Cherokee Battalion. Well, the battalion served as the home guard for both East Tennessee and Western North Carolina, charged with guarding railroad bridges and mountain passes. After being ordered into East Tennessee to set up a presence in that pro-Union part of the state, William Thomas convinced his superiors to allow him to recruit additional soldiers, both Indian and white, which was approved. By the summer of 1862, he had put together a regiment of five companies, three being white and two being Cherokee. In September, Thomas was elected colonel of the regiment, now known as Thomas's Legion, or to some locals as the Highland Rangers. This force averaged between 1,500 and 2,000 men during the Civil War. Thomas's Legion was one of the most highly respected and honorable regiments in the Confederate military, But one incident stands out in contrast to that reputation, and that occurred in East Tennessee. Well, in late 1862, part of the Legion, under Thomas's command, was involved in a skirmish with federal troops. The Legion had been ordered into Powell Valley in Tennessee, and on September 13th, a Cherokee company was ambushed by an Indiana regiment at Baptist Gap, 10 miles north of Rogersville, Tennessee, near the Virginia state line. Well, after an initial exchange of gunfire, the Indians charged the Union soldiers to engage in combat. Their leader, Lieutenant John Estugatoge, was shot and killed by a Union soldier. Well, Rod, this death so enraged the other Cherokee that they began scalping dead and wounded American soldiers and continued to do so until Colonel Thomas ordered them to stop. Well, Thomas ordered that no mention of this incident was to ever be made and he returned the scalps to federal officials for burial in the hopes of stopping Union retribution. And why, Rod, were they so incensed at the death of this one soldier? Mm. Well, Astugatoge was the grandson of the late chief, Junaluska, who had saved Andrew Jackson's life at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in Alabama during the War of 1812, and a much-revered chief to the Cherokee soldiers. 
Junaluska's presence in North Carolina was owed to William Thomas, who convinced the state legislature to grant the old chief citizenship and land near what's now Robbinsville so that he could actually return home to North Carolina from Oklahoma in his old age. Well, Thomas's legion also fought in many other battles in and around East Tennessee, including the Battle of Strawberry Plains, in which Union forces destroyed the Strawberry Plains Railroad Bridge over the Holston River, probably the most important bridge in East Tennessee, as well as at Sevierville and in White Oak Flats, now Gatlinburg. The fighting in Sevier County started with the capture on December 8, 1863, of several of Thomas's Legion scouts who were locked up in the county jail. William Thomas was furious. Rapidly advancing to Sevierville with about 200 men, Thomas surprised and captured the guard at the jail and then released his imprisoned men. He also captured about 60 home guards, six federal soldiers, and their guns and ammunition. Right behind Thomas and the Indians was Colonel William J. Palmer's 15th Pennsylvania Cavalry. And it was at Gatlinburg that Palmer and his men caught up with the Legion, engaging the Cherokee. For about an hour, they exchanged volleys. Thomas and the Indians had camped at the foot of a steep wooded ridge where they retreated up into the surrounding mountains and continued to fight from the cover of the woods. Once their ammunition ran out, Thomas and his men disengaged and moved further into the Smokies. Although he rescued the Legion scouts, Thomas recorded that two Indians were wounded during the skirmish. On the other hand, Colonel Palmer stated that they had wounded three Indians. He further reported three Federals wounded, a sergeant with a minor flesh wound, and two captains with serious wounds, one in the arm, the other in the knee. Palmer also noted that they had gotten their hands on Thomas's hat. Oh, a prize indeed, I can tell you. Well, that's true. Well, the force returned to North Carolina over the Smokies to their home in western North Carolina. Well, Thomas's Legion also fought in southwest Virginia, having been ordered to the Shenandoah Valley toward the end of the war to assist Robert E. Lee in his fight against the Union invaders. During their time in Virginia, the Legion arrived in Saltville to help in that battle, as we had mentioned in an earlier podcast. It was after the battle that they discovered that guerrilla leader Champ Ferguson and his men were going through the local hospital executing African-American Union soldiers and their white commanders, and they put a stop to that massacre. Well, by April 1865, the Legion numbered 1,200 men, 400 of whom were Cherokee. Two weeks later, Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, and Thomas's Legion headed south to North Carolina, not yet having officially surrendered. And here's where it gets a little interesting in how they actually surrendered to Union forces. You see, on May 6, 1865, Union Colonel William C. Bartlett's 2nd North Carolina Federal Mounted Infantry were raiding, pillaging, burning homes, and engaging in other activities to undermine the economic base of western North Carolina. Locals had sent word to William Thomas, and he and his men attacked the Union forces at White Sulphur Springs east of Waynesville. Bartlett's forces retreated into Waynesville, and on the evening of May 6, Thomas's legion arrived in the hills around the town and surrounded it. The Cherokee soldiers lit numerous bonfires on the ridges above the town, and then, Rod, they engaged in Indian war chants in an effort to intimidate the Federals. And um, actually, those efforts must have worked like a charm, because the following day, the Confederate commanders, General James Green Martin, and Colonel William Thomas were able to negotiate a surrender. The three officers came down into Waynesville, escorted by what Union Colonel W.C. Bartlett later described as, quote, 20 of the biggest Cherokee Thomas could round up. Well, Bartlett was so impressed with these men and the impression they made that he actually allowed them to keep their sidearms and equipment and let Thomas know that he and his men would leave the area. Thus, Thomas Legion became the last Confederate soldiers to surrender in North Carolina. Well, by this point, William Thomas himself, although honored for his service and for the fine service of his men, was deeply in debt. His business enterprises were in ruins after the war, and his physical and mental health declined until his death in 1893 at the age of 88 years old. Now, there is a story. You know, I had uh, I had never heard of the Cherokee forming a legion to fight in the Civil War. I had not either. I had not heard that until 
we did this tonight. And that's the story of Thomas's Legion, another story in the history of Appalachia. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or on your favorite podcast app. We're on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia. Like us for more stories about Appalachia. We're on Twitter as well, at Story Appalachia. Again, thanks for listening. Until next time, take care. So long, everybody.